Well, first of all, I want to thank uh, Carmel, Denise, and James for organizing this whole uh, session. I think it's been very good, and I've liked a lot of the papers, very informative. And um, of course, I want to um, also thank uh, Jasmine, Corina, and Denise for the paper they just gave. When I originally put my topic in to talk about Jane and her relationship to language documentation and um, education and revitalization and, um, and all of these matters, I was doing so because I wanted there to be something on this topic to which Jane has been such a key contributor and over so many years. So I, I now see that um, especially the last paper has preceded this in a very um, interesting and, and useful way. So um, thank you all who gave the last paper. This uh, paper that I'm, I am giving is much more of a reminder, I would say, than a real paper. What I wanted to do, as I said, was to remind everybody of the kind of role that Jane has had over so many years in all of these areas. And um, I also, Carmel, maybe you can help me here, but I also had one particular screen that I wanted to share with people. Is that possible to do? Carmel? <laughs> I'm not sure what's happened to her. Sorry, I'm um, okay, yes, I'm doing that now. I'll just um, get that. Okay, up. well, this would be a good moment if we can do it. Let's see how, yes, it, we, how it goes. We absolutely can do it. I wasn't sure if you yes. could do that. Because I'm, I'm, I'm just on the subject of reminders. Okay. And so this is a, a reminder. Here it is. I see it coming up. Okay, I'll just Thank share you. my screen. Right. <clears throat> Okay. So, okay. This is a, this is also a reminder. Um, I sent this to Carmel. I have no other PowerPoints, but I wanted to put this in as a, a recollection of something. And that is, you know, people may or may not know who all those people are there. The one in the yellow hat is me. The one in, in the middle is Daphne Nash, who is David Nash's sister. And the one behind is uh, her sister-in-law, Jane. And we were on our way to Kangaroo Island. And this was in 2014, just around the time when it had been cl become clear that the uh, Center of Excellence at ANU for the, the dynamics of language was getting a Guernsey. And so we were kind of uh, celebratory. And you will also see that like the three graces in the Botticelli uh, picture of Primavera, there we are sort of on a clamshell. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought I'd share that picture with you um, as a reminder of that uh, moment when Jane had also put so much work into the, um, the establishment of the, it is, and Rob, that is David behind the rock. Yes, very well spotted. <laughs> But he was, he was not um, not a game to be in the picture with the three graces. Um, okay, well, let, having having reminded ourselves of that era, let me proceed to what I was going to say. I was going to begin by referring to Jane's uh, Horwood lecture of 2019, when she said that we were in the International Year of Indigenous Languages. She talked about the fact that the whole continent had been covered with hundreds and hundreds of speech communities and different languages, but in, it, it was evident that the number of people speaking an indigenous language as a first language had massively dropped. She referred to the fact that that was down below 40,000 people, and of those 40,000, there were only about 13 languages still spoken by children, all in remote areas. And she also referred to Jambarapuingo, which is the biggest traditional language spoken in Eastern Arnhem Land, which has about 4,000 speakers, Pichanjachara, Walbury, and so on. And all of these have relatively small numbers by 
uh, comparative standards. Now, that kind of scenario has been depicted and discussed in numerous articles and works. It's gloomy enough so that one could join with many others in seeing the future of minority languages in dark terms. But throughout her career, Jane has combined kinds of work that transcend the gloom of dire outcomes and has been continually engaged in defining and galvanizing workable people-oriented outcomes. So that's the touchstone of my title. The title of this paper, as I had it, is Steady As She Goes, where Jane knows all the arguments, the reasons, and the different ways of viewing these issues of language endangerment, death, documentation, revitalization, and so forth. And she's occupied herself with finding positive ways forward in the varying particular circumstances. Now, in that recent Horwood lecture, Jane set out what she thinks that supporters and involved persons can do. She said that we can celebrate the languages. We can also try to reduce the pressure on indigenous people to switch to English. We can help and push for indigenous people to receive training to teach in and about their languages. And we can work with Indigenous people to provide technological and pedagogical support for documenting the languages and creating teaching resources for use in schools and in language maintenance. So what I want to do as a reminder in this paper is to illustrate all of the ways in which Jane has operationalized this statement. But let me say something else first. For a lot of people, for a lot of academics, I think there is there comes within a career a sort of shift of waiting from academic concerns with language documentation description theory and so on to increasing concern with the issues of well-being uh, the language landscapes of children accompanying the kinds of, of work and community involvement but the idea that this has been a major shift in jane's case is not quite right because what strikes me, and I think others, is the extent to which these concerns have been imminent in Jane's life and work right through. Social and cultural concerns have long been there in various forms. They've been materializing throughout her career and led, of course, to her appointment in 2011 as, at the ANU as the inaugural chair of Indigenous Linguistics. Now, for many other academics, I would say a major shift has been involved, and there has been, on the part of some people, a move from the sort of dark scenario to positive action. But as I'm saying, I don't think that's Jane's case. Uh, one other comment just on the general period that we're in. I think there's been a sounding of the term Anthropocene from at least the mid-1970s, and we have entered an era which has been more oriented to the identification of responsible agency and roused us from any um, sort of complacency concerning human beings, humankind's being in the world and the kinds of effects that we have on the world. So in other words, there's been more orientation to the uh, fact that things are changing and people are responsible for change. And I think along with this has gone a greater concern and a greater grasping for um, people to, be, to become active and to deal with these issues of language endangerment and, um, and also language revitalization. But on the gloomier side, I have to mention a couple of ethnographic um, notes. On the gloomier side, I'm reminded of a person with whom I worked and who was very uh, influential, I think, you know, on me. I worked long term on the Northern Australian language called Jowen. Uh, if indeed we can be said to have worked on it, work implies a kind of systematicity, systematicity which I think often eluded me in that field situation. The, this man I'm thinking about was a veteran of the rough minefields to the north of Catherine, and he was an escapee of various aspects of welfare management. 
I worked with him over years. Uh, re he treated me as daughter and I him as father. I sought to learn and record his language of which he was, I think, the most artful speaker that I encountered. Some other Jowan speakers were far more given to systematicity than he was, but he was definitely tolerant uh, and involved in my efforts to learn. And he was definitely intrigued by how much could be learned from him a completely fluent speaker, but he assessed any claim for the value of that effort, of my effort from the perspective of his own experience. I ventured to say once that this record we were making would be useful for his children, his daughters and family. And he quickly, he quickly punctured what he saw as the pretense. He said, good for white fellows, not for my family. In short, his own vision was the product of his experience and it was also slightly apocalyptic. He spoke from what he saw as the end of an era about a time, his time, in which Jowan was one of three languages he spoke natively, other, he also spoke other Gunwin languages, but it was a time he was thinking about after which it would simply not be part of anybody's everyday world in any form he could recognize. And so 10 minutes have, remaining. Pardon? Hello? 10 so, minutes remaining. Okay, so let me move more quickly to, uh, to Jane's contributions, which I wanted to talk about. Um, first of all, celebrating the languages. That's the first point that she said we could contribute to. Now, Jane's worked, of course, throughout her academic life on Walbury and Waramuru. She got her PhD, as we know, from MIT in 83 for a study of Walbury in the lexical functional grammar framework. She set up she helped set up a language center in Tennant Creek in that early period. She worked as linguist in the Barclay region. She's been a key contributor, of course, to the ongoing Walbury Dictionary Project with Mary Loughran and many others. With San Samantha Disbray, she worked on the Waramuru Text and Dictionary Project. She's used her experience, her archival and interpretive skills to assist Rob Amory, who's, who's out there, in the long-term project of revitalizing the Kaurnell language of Adelaide. And with him, she wrote the, the very uh, attractive and useful Kaurnell Learner's Guide, which I've used as a kind of model for other things of that sort. The Kaurnell project involved close analysis and use of the German sources on the language and its restoration from the status of a non-spoken but unusually amply documented language by the German uh, religious community to a growing community of some reported 50 speakers today in the larger field of public policy maintenance and celebration of indigenous languages jane has worked with michael christie on the living archive of aboriginal languages and she was lead investigator of the national indigenous language report in 2018-19 now, to the point of moderating the pressure of English, Jane's also contributed there. For example, with others, including Caffrey and, and Pat McConville, she commented strenuously on the ill-advised disassembling of bilingual education in the Northern Territory in 2008. She also was writing for a general off audience often. She poignantly titled one article in the conversation, Indigenous Languages Won't Survive If Kids Are Learning Only English. She wrote a number of other articles in the conversation that are for a general audience. They present issues of language and well being, the relation between them, the state of Australia's indigenous languages, and what can be done to help preserve them, and questions around language maintenance and revival. Now, on the point of training, Jane's contributions to training of linguists and of community language workers have been diverse, numerous, and consistent over many years. For instance, she was an organizer of the 1992 inaugural Australian Linguistics Institute in Sydney, continued as principal organizer over years, and also initiated an Indigenous Linguistics Institute. Since the founding of the Center of Excellence for the Dynamics of Language, Jane's been a regular participant in the Center of Excellence summer schools. She's been set, central to the setting up of language teaching award named after William Dawes and Pajigarang to recognize outstanding achievements in language teaching. She's contributed numerous chapters and articles through writings on language education and teaching, the making of dictionaries, the language ecologies and experiences of children. 
the, this latter concern is explored in your publications and many collaborations on language skills testing, input to children in remote Aboriginal communities, language environments of preschool children with Gillian Wigglesworth. She has delivered invited training courses in Australia, the United States, Germany, Scotland. In Australia, she's given courses for Indigenous languages and speakers at Port Augusta, Tennant Creek, Lajamano, Uendmu, and Alice Spring. And of course, one measure of Jane's dedication to training has been well illustrated in this conference in her list of over 20 completed PhD students for whom she was principal super supervisor, the largest number of these having written on topics to do with indigenous and emerging contact languages, the relation between them, second language learning, sociolinguistics, conversational analysis, grammatical description and analysis at all levels. On training and pedagogical support, and not to be sharply distinguished from Jane's contribution to training has been her manifold technical and pedagogical support to language maintenance, revival, and community issues. She's carried out numerous consultancy for Aboriginal legal aid, for Aboriginal Sacred Sites Protection Authority, the Central Land Council, and other organizations. She's led or contributed to numerous po public policy documents, including on Indigenous language learning, well being in relation to Indigenous language use and maintenance, education, and language planning. Now, let me conclude with just one little nugget, one little instance of something that I particularly appreciated in Jane's writing recently. A few years ago, I was trying to describe the way in which I was experiencing and had experienced in the North, the way in which Indigenous people related to Western concepts of work. Then I found, with her help, I found that Jane had written an insightful and, and useful article titled Working Verbs, the Spread of a Lone Word in Australian Languages in 2016. This paper showed that there had not been in any Aboriginal language a lexeme or concept which closely approximated the Western concept of work in its contrastive relation to other activities and its formulation of the concept of activity conducted in order to gain a living as distinct from everyday living itself. Rather, most Australian languages have a fulsome set of concepts of various kinds of livelihood activities, hunting, foraging, many aspects of these, tool production, weaving, holding of ceremony, and so on. But there was no lexicalization of work as a separate domain of activity oriented to gaining subsistence. And Marxists would say maybe this rendered people, uh, indigenous people, ripe for appropriation in the Western context into the historically developing context of wage labor, for ex example, on pastoral properties and exploitation of them. Such exploitation has been the ground of recent attempts on the part of Aboriginal people to recoup stolen wages, which they now realize should have been theirs while they were working. The closest to the foreign concept of work is that of Jama, I believe, which comes into Eastern Arnhem, Northeastern Arnhem Land from the Catharese and has then been redistributed in partly indigenous terms in such phrases as bungul Jama, ceremony, business, or work. One thinks how much a focused comparative investigation like that can tell us about differences between customary indigenous forms of life and Western ones. One also realizes how big a role those differences have played in relations between the two parties, indigenous and settler, in the context of the history of occupation of the continent and indigenous response to it. So in conclusion, never, as far as I know, daunted by all of the difficulties and the obvious um, large issues, Jane has worked steadily on all the fronts she identified in her 2019 Horwood lecture. I believe she has done this in the conviction that the generation of positive and collaborative undertakings produces its own forms of identity and cultural activity. To work on in this way requires firmness of purpose, distancing of negativity, much focus and effort, collaboration with many different kinds of people in diverse circumstances, and I think a good dose of mother henning. Resoluteness and positive purpose are Jane to a T. Thank you.